Today's November 16th, 2015. We're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center. And with me today is Sue Verhoff, who is the senior archivist at the History Center. Uh, we're honored to have with us Mr. John Lilly and his wife, Dana Lilly. Mr. Lilly is an Air Force veteran, uh, has a career Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, I believe. Yes. And uh, he's kindly agreed to join us today and tell us about his life and particularly about his military experience. Uh, this is in connection with the Library of Congress Veterans History Project, and uh, we're really honored that you've come in here to tell us your story, and we're looking forward to hearing it. And uh, we're excited that your story will be made a permanent record at the Library of Congress and the Atlanta History Center. Could you give us your full name and the city and state where you currently live? Sure, I'm John Osborne Lilly Jr. and I currently live in Decatur, Georgia. Okay. Uh, where and when were you born? I was born on the 22nd of May, 1944 in Quitman, Georgia. Quitman is a small town uh, then of about 5,000 people between Valdosta and Thomasville on the southern edge of the state. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. If you've read To Kill a Mockingbird, you've got a good idea of what Quitman was like when I was growing up. To Kill a Mockingbird was set earlier than, than I grew up in the 40s and 50s, but Quitman to me seems in retrospect much like the town that they depict in To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, small town, rural town, uh, farm economy. Um, in those days, uh, we, we literally didn't lock our doors. Uh, very segregated uh, part of the country then. Um, and uh, it was just, it was just an ordinary childhood, I guess. My, uh, my, my parents, I have two siblings, a brother who's five years younger than I and a sister who's seven years younger. And the three of us and my parents lived in a house that was next door to my mom's parents, my grandparents. And uh, my dad, at, by that time, was, was traveling. He had a job as a traveling salesman, so he was gone from Monday morning until Friday afternoon every week. And, and so I hung around with my, with my granddad a lot. He had a, had a cotton gin, he owned a cotton gin, and uh, a Texaco oil distributorship. And, and I tagged around with him. My, my memories are tagging around with him all over the place, all over equipment. He was just a fascinating guy. He could fix anything. Uh, he, he, he could fix the organs in the church, the three main churches, Baptist, Methodist, and Presbyterian, each had pipe organs. And I remember many Sundays him getting calls to Sunday morning early before church going down to fix one of the, the organs. And I'd tag along with him and look in the back of the organ. And it was just, it was amazing. But he was, he, he was, he was very handy. He could do anything, it seemed to me. And, uh, then we'd we'd go down. I'd go down to the gin with him, and a cotton gin is a really dangerous place. And surprisingly, I never got maimed or killed. Uh, but it's it, it is surprising because there's just so much that could happen there. I got to uh, to get down into the into the, the trailers, sometimes mule drawn, sometimes with trucks that pulled up under the um, under the cover of the of the gin and the big standpipe that sucked the cotton up into the gin. And I got to, to play with that, you know, move it around sometimes. And then the cotton would go into the gin through these big rollers and, and come out the other end. The seeds would go in one direction and the, and the cotton would go in the other and get put into huge bales, 500 pounds, I think, although I'm not sure. It was just a fascinating place to be around. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I was interested in, in, in technical things. I was interested in electronics and radio and and TV and that sort of thing. I was also interested in music, and and I started uh, playing in the band in the in middle school. Actually, we called it junior high, uh, and then, and that continued through through high school, where I played the French horn. I also started singing then uh, in the church choir and the glee club, uh, high school glee club, and that that is something that I've continued to do through my life. Um, I worked at a at the local. Um, TV, radio sales and repair shop, and they sold um, stereos and, and records also. Worked after school 
there uh, and, and uh, ended up spending most of what I earned, I think, on, on records. Uh, I, I began to love classical music. My mom bought us a record player. It wasn't a stereo because in the 50s there was, it was hi-fi, it was one, mm -hmm. one channel. And the local colonial store, the, the, uh, the food store where she shopped, had, had albums, maybe one a month or something like that, that, that you could buy of classical music. And, and inside the box was an album and a book about the composer and the music. So she got those every once in a while. And, and I started really appreciating classical music. And that's something that's, that's continued. Um, I did okay in school. I wasn't a great student, but I managed to managed to, to get out with decent enough grades to get me into Emory. Um, so I came up to here to Atlanta when I was 18, and and as it turned out, I was totally unprepared for college. Um, the, the the combination, I think, of the freedom and the rigorous academics uh, just hit me like a bulldozer. It took me. Uh, four years and a couple of months to graduate. I'm, I, I doubt I ever recovered from the shock of Emory, but <laughs> but what I like to tell people is I think I got a better education at Emory than I deserved. Uh, but it was a great experience. Yeah. Um, when I was at Emory, I, I sang in the Glee Club. Uh, uh, Dr. Bill Lemons was the director there and, and was for quite some time. And uh, I kind of learned how to sing, really, really sing with Dr. Lemons. Um, after uh, after school, there was really not much question of me doing anything else but going into the service. It wasn't something I especially wanted to do, but um, with my with the combination of my grades and uh, not really wanting to anyway, I could not have gotten into graduate school if I'd wanted to. And, and so my student deferment would was gone. And I, I like to say that I thought I looked better in blue than green and liked <laughs> flying better than walking. And, and so I, I enlisted in the Air Force. Uh, I was told that I could be a pilot by the recruiter. And of course, everybody knows that recruiters never tell anything but the absolute truth. Uh, I wore glasses. And he said, oh, sure you can. Uh, but when I took my flight physical, the doctor said, are you kidding? No way, you can't be a pilot. Uh -huh. So I ended up going to, uh, applying for and going to navigator training uh, at Mather Air Force Base in Sacramento after OTS. So I, I went to OTS uh, in, in uh, San Antonio uh, starting in April and graduating in the end of June of 1967. And after that, uh, I got married and went out to California, to Sacramento, to start my real Air Force career as, a, as an officer. Let me ask you a question. When, when you joined the Air Force, uh, the war in Vietnam was going on and it was starting to escalate. Mm -hmm. How did your parents feel about you joining the service? Uh, I never remember talking to them about it. I obviously did, but I just don't recall. So yeah. they must not have done anything very dramatic or I might remember it. Um, I suppose they figured that I'd be safer in the Air Force than in the Army anyway, so yeah. they were probably relieved that I chose yeah. that to do. Yeah. But I, I don't recall that we ever had that conversation. Okay, okay. continue on. Uh, so navigator training, uh, nine months in Sacramento. It's not bad duty. Uh, <laughs> Sacramento's a great place to be, especially if you're young and don't have any money. Um, because we could we could get in the car and drive to Lake Tahoe in, in an hour and a half, wow. drive to San Francisco wow. in an hour and a half. And, <laughs> And that was nice. Sounded like a good assignment. Yeah, it was. So, so I, I finished navigator training in uh, April of '68, and uh, then went into uh, the next phase of my training, which was electronic warfare. Uh, navigators could be either navigators on something like a C-130 or C-141, or you could go to maybe call it postgraduate school and and or graduate school rather. And, and get training in electronic warfare or, or, or to become a bombardier. Um, and I chose electronic warfare because I was a geek then, I still am. Mm -hmm. And uh, that training took six months. And at the end of that, uh, assignments came around and I was chosen as one of the people to stay at school and be an instructor. The, they would really rather have had people with operational experience 
but everybody was going to combat, to the war, or to, to fulfill those operational positions that most of the graduates were. They couldn't get them back into the school fast enough to, to be instructors, and so they kept several of us, probably eight or ten of us over a few classes uh, to be instructors. And we all taught in the, in the basic fundamentals part of the course, which was electronics. Uh, we taught officers uh, with majors in everything from, from agriculture to masters in electrical engineering. And uh, that's really a mixed bag. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's interesting to teach a class with that wide a spread of experiences. In any case, uh, I, I stayed there for four years teaching electronics and, and also um, reconnaissance. And, and so most of my time was platform instruction. Um, and then um, we also, also did flight instruction, so teaching, teaching people in the simulators and in the airplanes. T-29 was the airplane we were flying. It was a, 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 a twin, um, twin engine Convair, Convair 880, I think it was, but I'm not sure. Anyway, the Air Force called it the T-29. And those airplanes were fitted out with, with electronic warfare positions, and we'd, we'd uh, sit behind the students and watch them operate the equipment and grade them and, and that sort of thing. So I did that for four years. And then it um, came time to leave and uh, we got to request assignments to different aircraft. Uh, I chose the AC-130 gunship. Um, I, it was an overseas assignment, it was a combat tour. Uh, and it was a deliberate decision because by that time, I guess I had decided that maybe the Air Force was a good thing to try to do for a long time. I, I don't remember when I consciously made that decision, but it just kind of evolved, and I figured if, if I'm going to make the Air Force a career, there's some things I've got to do. Uh, one of them is uh, get a lot of flying time. Another was to get combat, get a combat tour, mm -hmm. and, and the other one was to get some decorations, and so that's why I took the 130 assignment. Yeah. Um, went to uh, survival school at Fairchild Air Force Base in, in, up in uh, eastern Washington, Spokane. Uh, and, and that was also when we did the, uh, the, the, the uh, simulated concentration camp experience, which I won't ever forget. I'm just glad I never had to use that training. Was that pretty realistic? Based it on was. There was there was a lot of classroom stuff, but the, there was a concentration camp part of it. I'll get back to that in a second. And and they they also took us out into the mountains of of eastern Washington and left us there for a couple of days. And we had to navigate and mm -hmm. and do on, be on our own. And it was November, so it was pretty chilly. Yeah. The the concentration camp started out with uh, you, you were trying to do some escape and evasion, get get away from the bad guys, and you had to crawl under barbed wire and all that kind of stuff. Nothing like, I'm sure, Army, the Army put you guys through, but nevertheless, for Air Force wimps, it was pretty traumatic. <laughs> of course, we all got captured and, uh, and then taken and put in, in little cells that were, uh, one, one to a cell, and the cells were probably maybe three by three by four or five. You couldn't stand up in them. You couldn't lie down in them. You had to kind of sit with your, with your knees pulled up. And, and so we were we were there for ultimately a day and a half. It seemed like weeks, um, and uh, taken out every once in a while, and and uh, and uh, blindfolded, and told to uh, to put your put your hands on the shoulders of the animal in front of you, and then march to somewhere to be interrogated. Before the interrogation, we were put in these other little boxes that you had to kneel down, and kind of hunch over in. And then they, and you literally couldn't move, and that was when they started playing the Joan Baez music, and and they played Joan Baez music for weeks. It wasn't really, but it seemed like it. Ever since then, I have not been able to stand the sound of a Joan Baez, of a Joan Baez record. Anyway, we had some interrogations taken back, fed, fed what they call fish heads and rice. I'm not sure what it was, but I doubt it was that. In any case, we were glad to get whatever it was. Um, but as I said, after that, I was just really thrilled not to have to use that training. I can't imagine the guys yeah. who actually had to, yeah. had to do it. Um, but it was training. I mean, it was, it yeah. was make-believe, and we knew that. And there's a huge difference 
when you know it's only going to be a day or two. Yeah. Then sure makes you appreciate more. what those guys went through. Then, it does, it? yeah. Uh, after that, uh, water survival at Homestead, which was kind of like a vacation after uh, Homestead in Florida, which was kind of like a vacation after Fairchild. Um, we learned how to how to how to get dropped out of a helicopter over the Biscayne Bay and and inflate our life rafts and drift around on the on the bay for a while. Um, left left the U.S. left my family in uh, in Georgia and uh, left the U.S. about Valentine's Day of of 2000. Sorry, 1973. Um, went to Clark Air Base in the Philippines for jungle survival school. That took a couple of days, and then to Uban Air Base in yeah. Northeast Thailand, and that was where my gunship tour began. Um, the gunship's an interesting airplane. It's a, the C-130 is really, it's a workhorse. It's a very durable airplane, been in the, in the inventory forever, built right here up, up in Marietta at Lockheed. And uh, we needed a gunship. Um, the gunship's mission is interdiction. It's to, to kill trucks, essentially. And, and at the time, uh, the North Vietnamese were sending convoys through Laos and Cambodia down into the south to resupply their troops down there. And our mission was to, to find the convoys and, and stop the trucks. Um, by that time, by, by 73, um, the war in Laos was essentially, we weren't sending gunships to Laos anymore. We'd lost one or two of them. Uh, and, but we were just flying over Cambodia, so all of my combat missions were over Cambodia. Uh, and uh, the gunship was a neat airplane. It, it, it was a C-130 with uh, two 20 millimeter, 20 millimeter Gatling guns uh, just aft of the, of the front door, and then a 40 millimeter Bofors cannon um, to the rear of that on some models that have two 40s. Uh, on other models, they had a 40 and 105 millimeter howitzer. Um, the the guns were operated by the pilot on 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 the models with the two 40 millimeter guns. They were operated by the pilot, and and the pilot. Well, I haven't talked about the sensors. Actually, there was there was there were three sensors and a booth in the cargo bay of the airplane, and the sensors picked up the targets on the ground. So the way it worked was that. Uh, a sensor operator would see a target. The three sensors were one called the Black Crow, which was what I operated. Um, it was an ignition sensor, so for a while they were using trucks with spark plugs, and you could actually see the see the RF em emissions from the spark plugs mm -hmm. miles away. Mm -hmm. uh, then they got smart and started using diesel. So by the time I got over there, there weren't too many trucks that I could see with the BC. Yeah. I also operated the the radar warning receiver and the and the jammers in case we had any radar radar threats, but yeah. we didn't. The biggest threat to us when I was over there was, was getting getting hit by a bomb from a B-52 above us oh, yeah. who were dropping bombs at high level. We were at about 10, 10 12,000 feet, and the, the the buffs were at, at well, 40,000 feet. I assume that feet. was coordinated before you it went It was on coordinated, and they, also, they always were supposed to call, uh, call out strike notices called arc light notices. But if for some reason you didn't hear it, or they forgot to do one, you could be in real danger. And, and I was a couple of times. I mean, nothing, nothing, nothing inches away or anything. But but still, that that something bad could have happened. But nothing did. In any case, that you pick up the the sensor operator, either the BC or the infrared operator or the TV operator picks up a target. There's a fourth position called the fire control officer, and that guy kind of coordinates all the targets. He will hand off a target from one sensor to the other because the least accurate but longest range is the BC, then the IR, then the TV. The TV is the most accurate but has the shortest range. So the, the, the FOCO would decide on what sensor, and once we had acquired a target and, and had a good sensor lock on, the fire control t officer would tell the pilot that he was cleared to fire. The pilot has a, an A7 gun sight in his left hand window. And basically, that's a piece of glass with a, a, an etched reticle in the middle, which corresponds to the bore side of the airplane, the extension of the wing. 
So that's where the guns will shoot because the guns are mounted to the airplane. And he also, so he has a fixed, a fixed pipper there that's the airplane and a movable pipper which represents the, the, uh, the tracking of the target. So his job was to fly the airplane in what's called a 30 degree pylon turn which means that the airplane is flying like that. In other words, the wing, if, if you could draw a line from the wingtip to the ground, you'd, you'd, it was like, like you were tethered to the ground. That yeah. was the, huh. the geometry. So the pilot got in that kind of geometry. The co-pilot would watch the altitude and the airspeed, and the pilot would be looking out, and he had a trigger on his, on his um, yoke. And, and then once he got the, the two sets of crosshairs superimposed, he'd start firing. Um, so that's the way the gunship worked. It was a very, very effective w weapon system, but it had to have a permissive airspace. You couldn't, if, if there was any threat there, a C-130 at 12,000 feet is a sitting duck for, for a surface-to-air missile or anti-aircraft. Well, there was no th real threat in Cambodia, so we were okay. Um, so I was over there for 10 months. Uh, I did uh, 93 combat missions. Um, and we actually continued to fly combat missions past the 30th of June, which was when the war officially ended. For some reason, they kept us flying through the middle of August. Um, so I got combat pay for another two months. Later now, on, later on, the IRS audited, audited me, and I had to prove that that, that was legal. But Are you anyway. serious? Yeah. They really did. That? Yeah, they did. Thank God. Was there a limit, like in World War II, with certain crews? You flew a certain number of missions, and then you flew no more. We didn't. We didn't have that. We had fixed length tours. So normally the the tour was a year, uh, and it was however much you flew in a year. Uh, I didn't know that I was going to be leaving early, but still, I wanted to get. I wanted to get. Uh, the, the, the decoration I really wanted to get was a Distinguished Flying Cross, and you had to do 89 missions, I think, for a DFC, and I managed to get 93, so. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Yes. Uh, but that was, it was a pretty big deal. It was goal. And, you know, I, I know this sounds uh, kind of mechanical and planned and doesn't have a lot of the romance that war is supposed to have. I mean, you shouldn't be as calculating. I guess. This just occurred to me in thinking about talking about it, uh, but it was what I thought I needed to do to further my career, and, and it didn't seem like we were in much danger. Really, we weren't. I mean, I, I, I didn't have, some of my friends were in the Army in Vietnam, on, on the ground like you were, and, and, and my, I, I tell them that my war wasn't the same war as theirs. For me, it was kind of like watching it on TV because I was, I was 12,000 feet above, and, and by the time I was there, it, there were no SAM threats like there were in, in Laos a year or two before when, when we lost, an air, uh, lost a gunship. So it was a different kind of war. I mean, when we got home every, every night or every morning, we flew at night, mm -hmm. uh, so we'd, we'd typically take off at 10 or 11, 12 o'clock at night and get back early morning, <laughs> go to the officer's club and have dinner. Um, but you were still putting your life on the line every time you went up. Well, yeah, but but it didn't seem like that, and certainly not in the way that 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 the army guys were, or, or the marines. Um, so, yeah, I was, but it was it was a different kind of war. Um, and we got to go home and 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 have breakfast or dinner or whatever, and then go back and get showers, and yeah. I mean. It was different. Yeah. Did you get many after-action reports, like when you'd fly a mission? Were you able to find out exactly, or not exactly, but at least generally, what the result of the mission was? If 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 we were lucky, we could see it. I mean, we were watching the targets on the ground, and if we saw secondaries, yeah, we knew we had hit something. Yeah. Okay. More often than not, we didn't. Uh, flying as high as we were to get out of r the range of AAA, uh, because they had, I think, I think their biggest guns were, th and where we were were maybe 37 millimeter 
AAA. Mm -hmm. and, and we were above their altitude, but we were also high enough that the 20 millimeter rounds tumbled. We, the 20 is a great gun, and it fires 6,000 rounds a minute. I mean, it really puts out, mm -hmm. puts out fire, but you, at that altitude, you really couldn't use it. Mm -hmm. um, the 40 was our best weapon because 40 millimeter rounds could go that far, and, and the gunners loaded them in clips of four. They were top loaded guns, and so the gunners could just keep, keep feeding the clips in, and the pilot could go boom, 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 boom. With the 105, which was a much bigger gun, it was a breech loader, so there was this big cage around the back of the gun, yeah. and uh, because it recoiled also, it, right. it, it, it couldn't be bolted to the airplane because it would throw the airplane out of orbit if it were. Um, so the gunners had to open the cage, open the breech, take the spent shell out, put the new one in, and the shells weighed something like 65 pounds each. They were 40 pounds, as I remember, they were 40 pound shells and weighed about 65 pounds because we were in uh, an orbit, so the added centrifugal force made them seem heavier. I remember all this stuff because I was a briefer when I was when oh. I was there. That was one of my additional duties. But okay. in any case, then they had to put the new shell in, close the breech, close the cage, mm -hmm. tell the pilot that they were ready to, the gun was ready to fire. There were two other interesting, so there were a bunch of gunners, um, like six or seven of the gunner, of people were gunners. There were two other people on the airplane, uh, two other enlisted men, and they were, they were spotters. There was one guy who sat at a, an open window on the right-hand side of the airplane, just forward of the booth where we were. He was called the right spotter, and he looked out all the time looking for muzzle flashes from the ground. The other guy, excuse me, used to be called the illuminator operator, and that was because in the old days, in the, in the gunships before the 130s, there was actually a, a lantern that was mounted on the back of the airplane. The gunship, the, the 130 gunship flew with the ramp up and the door up. Normally it's like that. That's, that's the door, that's the ramp. Well, it flew like that, and the illuminator operator was really a spotter. He had a parachute harness on. His harness was attached by a, a a, a cable and to an inertial reel on the airplane, and he hung out to his waist over that over that ramp, yeah. looking because he had he could see almost 180 degrees yeah. around. Huh. He had a parachute on, obviously, and and, and uh, a harness, and was attached. We never lost any. I've heard stories of people of, of gun of, of IOs getting thrown out of the airplane in a maneuver and and having uh, this is probably apocryphal, but you know, it's like calling. Pilot, I owe permission to re-enter the airplane, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> I don't know if that really happened. Well, I, I assume that must have been high enough for the chute to open. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, you could always, you could, you could always op open it manually. I mean, yeah. at 12,000 feet still, yeah. it's, it's, okay. it's enough room if you pull it right away. And, and yeah. you can bet your boots if I fell out of an airplane at 12,000 <laughs> feet, I'd, I'd yeah. do that. Did you take fire very often? Not very often. There was not that much defense in Cambodia, um, but you know, still it was. We, we put in the time and we did the missions, and yeah. and uh, and I feel good about that. Now, when you were there, and this is '73, which is fairly late in the war. What was your sense of how the war was going? I realize you were in Thailand and you're one person, but it's it, it's always interesting to me. When somebody was there, like from seventy on, mm -hmm. uh, just the general attitude of you or your unit about how the war was progressing. We obviously weren't doing well because we were having to to keep them from going further and further down into South Vietnam, mm -hmm. uh, or try to keep them from it. Yeah. Um, there are stories even of the of the North Vietnamese using using pack animals to carry supplies and, and diesel trucks and things like that yeah. uh, to avoid us because um, it, it's it's hard to see something that doesn't have a very big heat signature like an engine yeah. with an IR yeah. with an IR. But we didn't obviously it wasn't going very well. Our, our, the tour was shortened and I was glad to get home two months early. Yeah. Um, but we knew it wasn't. Yeah. wasn't going very well. Did you have much experience dealing with the Thai people? Um, not a whole lot. I, I lived on base, 
some of the <clears throat> some of the guys uh, would would live downtown. Um, I did for the first probably the first month I was there live in a hotel downtown because there was no room on base and 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 uh, I remember uh, we were in a hotel we were at the in, on the top level <clears throat> and there were always the, uh, the the Buddhist monks wandering around. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember lots of times getting home from a mission at you know four or five six o'clock in the morning and and going to the hotel and then going up on the roof uh, and and just watching the the, the oh. town wake up and the, yeah. the monks wandering around and yeah. in their saffron I guess right. kind of yellowish saffron yeah. robes and huh. uh, but I didn't go native you know some people did yeah. uh, some people um, found people that they wanted to live with and yeah. and uh, moved downtown. Uh, we ate at the restaurants occasionally. Um, my favorite meal was what they called, uh, at this one particular restaurant, they called it Kobe beef. Mm -hmm. It was probably water buffalo, <laughs> but they called it Kobe beef, but really, really uh, tender and delicious. It was great. <laughs> Didn't matter what it was if it was good, right? Yeah. Th that was the time when we were on the, on the gold standard. And gold was thirty-five dollars an ounce, and 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 the bot, which was the Thai currency, was really low compared to the dollar, and you could get a lot of a lot of value for the money we spent. Yeah. And so I bought I bought a lot of custom-made clothes, none of which I ever wore when I got back to the U.S., but it <laughs> seemed like a good idea at the time, and I did buy some some jewelry. Um, but it was it was a different experience, although most of my experience was on the base with right. with Americans. Yeah. Well talk about uh, what happened once you got back and what it was like readjusting <coughs> to being back home and what you did from that point forward. Yeah. I, my assignment coming back to the U.S. was to be 52s at Griffiths Air Force Base in Rome, New York. Um, I thought I was going to have to go to, to Michigan uh, but got that changed to upstate New York, although I'm not sure that was a whole lot better. <laughs> but coming from a coming from a tropical climate to <laughs> yeah. to upstate New York was a real shock for me and my family. Uh, we had never we'd hardly ever seen snow, much less uh -huh. were prepared for it. And and at the time, I had a a wife and a two year old, and 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 an indeterminate number of cats, probably three or four of them. We had <laughs> lots of cats at the time, and, and so we drove up to Rome and. And uh, we didn't even have coats that were heavy enough to to uh, to withstand an upstate New York winter. Uh, and and sack was a different kind of outfit too. I mean, when I was in in Thailand, uh, those units were part of PACAF, the Pacific Air Command, and and the Eighth TAC Fighter Wing, which was where I was, which was at Ubon, it was it was an F four wing. Robin Olds was at one time the wing commander, and his he had a reputation for being a cowboy. Uh, by the time I was there, things had tightened up quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, but going into SAC after being in, in Air Training Command for four years, then PACAF for a year, was really different because SAC had the nuclear mission has, and um, everything was very buttoned down. Everything was very by the book. Uh, so it was it, that was yeah. an adjustment too, yeah. as well as as uh, coming back to upstate, upstate New York in, in February. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I was in, in, in B-52s at Griffiths for uh, about two years, I guess, two, maybe three years. And um, then uh, I, I was actually selected to go to Carswell Air, uh, sorry, Dias Air Force Base in Texas. <coughs> no, that's not right, it was Carswell. Uh, to uh, be in the initial cadre of, of EWs for uh, the B-1 program. This was in, this was in 76, probably, 77. Um, and uh, that was really a, a, an honor. Um, and I was really excited because I could see, that I was at, I was at almost the 10, yeah, I was still a captain. I was at almost the 10-year point by then, and I could see the rest of my career just laid out. <laughs> Well, um, we had put the house on the market. We had, I had the orders. We'd put the house on the market. We'd sold the snowblower. We'd had the garage sale. And um, 
and then Mr. Carter canceled B1 program. Oh, yeah. I was crushed. Yeah. Um, in any case, uh, that that all worked out because I ended up with a, a job at SAC headquarters after that, and, um, and that was a that was a good a good tour. Went to Offutt in Omaha, Offutt Air Force Base in Omaha after that, and and was there for three years. Um, during that time, um, I worked with uh, an outfit in the Nevada desert, uh, and uh, went out to their location several times and actually ended up getting an assignment out there uh, in 78. Um, uh, we lived in Las Vegas. Uh, I would uh, get up every morning, early every morning, and dress in civilian clothes, go to a, 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 a makeshift terminal at the west edge of McCarran Airfield, um, show my badge, get onto a, 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 um, an unmarked 737, excuse me, and fly out into the desert and work out there all day and then come back in the evening and drive home. So I did that for three years. Could you talk about what you were doing there or was that fairly... It was, it was flight test, but I'd have to shoot you if I told you more. <laughs> That's what I figured. <laughs> um, it was flight test. Yeah. Uh, we, I, I saw the first, the first flight of the F-117, for example, um, and some, some airplanes that have never, never saw the light of day. Huh. Uh, there were no, uh, no Martians. Uh, no, no spacecraft, none of that stuff. It was a great assignment. That was yeah. really a lot of fun and yeah. and uh, a neat place to be. <laughs> and uh, and after that, I uh, went to San Antonio, Texas, to Electronic Security Command, uh, and um, was there for um, well until I retired in 1989. So from 84 to 89. Now that must have been a fairly interesting assignment. It was. Um, we had two different jobs there. One was to run a, um, an intelligence uh, analysis outfit that had responsibility for determining, uh, based on collected intelligence, determining which threat changes, which threat radar changes would affect different pieces of Air Force, equip <coughs> Air Force equipment. Um, it was called Electronic Warfare Flagging, EW Flagging. So we'd get uh, ELINT, intercept information, and run it against um, the, known, the, the known parameters against which our receivers and jammers were supposed to work oh. and see if there would be issues, um, huh. if, if, see, if, see if a particular indicator needed to be changed or something like that, or if a new threat came up, what we had to do about it. So I did that for, for a couple of years and then uh, was put in charge of an organization that did uh, built a, a command and control communications countermeasures database uh, called Constant Web. And um, we, our, our mission was to collect all source intelligence from the different U.S. intelligence agencies and, and build a database of, of Soviet locations and communication links and things like that so that our com communication jamming systems uh, could um, could counter them. Hmm. And I retired from that job in 1989. So you really had some high-level security related assignments while you were... They were. Uh, 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 not a size some, but, but they were very interesting. and. Hmm. It's, it's kind of corny, but when people ask me, do I miss the Air Force, I think Dana's asked me on occasion, I say, what I really miss is, is wearing the uniform and uh, in, in the morning and in the evening, 8 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock in the afternoon on military installations, they, they raise and lower the flag and, and, and play music. And, and of course, you're supposed to, if you're in uniform, if you're outside, you're supposed to stop and salute yeah. and stay there. Well, people used to used to, to, to stop at the door of our building right at five o'clock and stay inside until that was over so they wouldn't have to do that. Yeah. But I used to always like it. I, it Good. As long as I was in the service, it felt like I was wearing a red, uh, red hat. Yeah. felt like I was wearing a white hat and yeah. doing, doing things that were Good for my family and me, and, and good for the country. Yeah. Um, and 
And so that's what I miss, the, the feeling of, I think, doing something important, of contributing, uh, of being part of this organization who's not looking out for itself, but, but looking to serve the country. Yeah. Uh, I haven't had that feeling since I, since I got out. Yeah, it's hard to match that feeling. It is, it is. And, 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 and again, it's not, I, I go back to what you've told me about your service, and, and it's not like the closeness that you get when you're in an Army unit, and depending on each other to save your life, yeah. but, but still you do have this camaraderie and, and, yeah. um, and something you're glad you did. Yes, yes, I am. And, 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 and I never expected to spend 22 years at it. It wasn't yeah. even in my, in my field of view when I, yeah. when I raised my hand the first time in Montgomery. Yeah. But I, I never regretted that I did that. Uh, I went into the Air Force with barely acceptable grades and a Bachelor of Arts in Physics from a liberal arts university. Uh, and I couldn't have gotten a job if I hadn't going into the Air Force. But in the Air Force, I learned, I learned skills, I acquired knowledge, uh, I, I grew up. And, and all of that allowed me to have a reasonably successful career, I think, and, and, uh, and then have other careers when I, when I got out. Talk about those other careers a little bit, what you did after you got out of the Air Force. Sure. 1989, um, I went to work for a company in East Texas, Greenville, Texas, called E-Systems. <coughs> uh, they had uh, a great business opportunity with the West German defense establishment to provide them with a high altitude, excuse me, a, a, a relatively inexpensive high altitude reconnaissance platform. The, um, the VP of the organization that hired me a guy named Dutch Meyer was was born German and naturalized American, and he had a contact with a sailplane builder in Bavaria, named whose last name is Grobe, G R O B. Um, Herr Grobe built uh, composite sailplanes, and 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 that was in the late 80s. Well, the use of composite airplanes now is even now is not that common. The seven, what 787 I think is the first all composite passenger airplane, but Herr Grobe was building, uh, building air composite gliders then, or powered gliders. He started with gliders and then, then we put, working with him, we put a, 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 a turboprop engine on one, and it was kind of a poor man's U-2. It could fly at 50,000 feet for 12 hours, single, single place airplane, uh, 50,000 feet for 12 hours taking pictures or, or collecting other kinds of intelligence. And so we were set. We, the, the, that contract was all but in the bag. Uh, the German Air Force was going to buy the airplanes and we would, Herr Grobe would provide them and we would put the, the equipment on them and, and, and I worked on that for a few months. But if you remember in 1989, the wall came down. Mm. Well, there you go. I mean, right. yeah. the, all of that went away. Yeah. Just in a in a heartbeat, it was great for Germany, obviously, but terrible for our business case. <laughs> so, I spent the next <clears throat> next couple of years trying to figure out business cases for other countries, other people to buy that airplane. We never sold any of them, yeah. um, and, and and after that, then I went to work for another part of E Systems called Serve Air, which was the services arm of E Systems. This was by then. This was ninety four, probably ninety three, ninety four, um, and we were trying to get into document imaging. Um, records, paper records, were just eating people up, and we said, "Well, we can we can turn these into bits. Mm. <clears throat> we can scan them and store them, and you can retrieve them when you need them." Mm. Uh, so we got one small contract from uh, a company in Dallas from Mobile Oil to, to, to um, image a million, a million of their land records. We, may, we completed that, uh, but the, we, didn't, we couldn't go any further. We, the equipment was too expensive, the labor was too expensive, and it just, I mean, you're, you're talking about tens of thousands of dollars to get set up to do something like that. Well, now you can do it for 
Well, pennies. Pennies, pennies yeah, yeah, but you couldn't then. So that just didn't really go anywhere. After that, uh, I went to work for um, a small company uh, in Dallas, in Richardson, Texas, called Intellect, I-N-T-E-L-E-C-T. And they made, um, they made uh, fault-tolerant uh, communication switches. Uh, for example, a fault-tolerant switch is a switch that has enough capacity to never, never bog down. If something breaks, it keeps on going. Um, uh, approach controls, FAA centers use things like that because they need to have their communication channel up and all the time. And um, I was went to work as a program manager and worked on a program for to build a switch for the Iceland, the Reykjavik Air Traffic Control Center in Iceland. Got to go up there for its commissioning, which was really neat. I'd never been to Iceland. Yeah. Um, after after that, uh, the company got involved in fiber optic um, in the fiber optic business, and and we won a contract to work with a company called MFS, Metropolitan Fiber Systems, on building the, the communication system for the Alaska Pipeline. Alcatel was the prime contractor and they built the big, the big ring. The, uh, with the fiber optics generally works on rings. You have a, a two rings, two concentric rings um, with signals running one way in one and the other way in the other. So if, a, so if, if one of them breaks, you can route it back around. So Alcatel built the, the main ring and we built the drops off of the ring so so you you have a ring you tap into it with a piece of equipment and then run a run a, like a trunk line out to somewhere else so we built that equipment for Alcatel uh, after that I went to work for Alcatel and uh, was there for um, that was that was ninety sorry yeah ninety Ninety six, ninety six, two thousand, I guess. Ninety seven, two thousand, um, and uh, was in the in the uh, the optical networking part of Alcatel for a while, uh, and then uh, finally the wireless communication part of Alcatel. Mm -hmm. uh, went to, and that was in Richardson, Texas. Then went to uh, to Ottawa for a year, almost a year. Um, it was supposed to be two years. The business, the business case kind of fell apart. The business kind of fell apart, that part of the business, and so we had to come back to the U.S. And, and so in 2001, we got back, Danny and I got back here. Uh, we bought a house in, outside of McDonough. Uh, she worked for Mercer, and I didn't have a job. So we, we bought a house that was part way to Macon. Uh, but not entirely to make yeah. them. And then uh, a year later, I still, and, and we moved here in July of 2001, and of course in September, it was 9-11, and, and the, I was trying to find a job in telecom, and things were already kind of shaky in telecom, and once 9-11 happened, just nobody was hiring. Yeah. So um, after a year of trying to find a job, I decided I needed to go back to school and um, went to Georgia State uh, and, and studied uh, studied instructional technology hmm. and uh, in a master's program. And part of that was a uh, an internship at IBM, wow. and that internship turned into a job at Singular because Singular was one of their clients whom I, for whom I worked. Um, so I went to work for Singular as an instructional designer and, uh, and got out 10 years later. I retired from AT&T, uh, still in training. So that's basically what, I've, wow. what my work career has been. Well, you had an extremely interesting post-military career, too. Yeah, yeah, I finally found a job I could hold down, I guess. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your family. Um, I have uh, have two sons. Uh, they are forty four and thirty nine. Um, they each have two children. Uh, the forty four year old has uh, a three year old and a ten year old. I hope I'm getting this right. Uh, and the uh, 
the 39-year-old has an 11 and a 14-year-old. Three boys, one girl. Yeah. Did I get that right? Okay. <laughs> my kids would kill. I, I couldn't show this to my kids if I got it wrong. Uh, the, the, the girl is the oldest. Grace is 14, and then, and then Evan is, Evan is 12. Zach's Evan's 11. Zach's Evan's 12. Yeah. Zach's 11, I guess. And um, I'm sorry, Sam is 11, sax 3. That's a lot to keep up with. Well, it is, and, and, and Dana has three grandchildren, and it's, 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 it's hard for us to remember whose, whose <laughs> birthday is next. And, yeah, I can and understand. And the, the, my oldest uh, and his family live near Stanford. He went to school there and uh, got his bachelor's and uh, and master's degrees at Stanford, and um, is a is a venture capitalist. Uh, works on Sand Hill Road in Palo Alto, and they live about a, a block off the Stanford campus. Um, they won't ever live. They won't ever leave there. They just yeah. they're 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 California people. Uh, my oh, my younger son lives north of uh, north of Austin in Round Rock, Texas, and and he's a software engineer for Oracle, um, and he his is uh, so Johnny my, my my oldest has the two has the two younger kids two younger grandchildren and my younger son has the two older grandchildren Miss Lily is there anything you would like to ask or add to the story yeah, I've enjoyed it. <laughs> Sue you have any questions I just have a, a question about the public did you experience any of the the antipathy that we hear so much about, either before, during, or after your Vietnam service? Uh, oh, sure, and, and I was probably grateful for the antipathy. I mean, antipathy is better than than violence, uh, than opposition. Uh, but but we didn't have any of the certainly not the kind of homecomings that that. He played after World War One and Two. Um, I don't know that I missed that. I was just glad to get home. Um, but it was just kind of a different ending to war. Of course, that war didn't um, that war didn't threaten America the way that the other wars, well, at least World War Two did. I mean, World War One didn't threaten America really, but but it threatened our allies. Vietnam, unless we were trying to stand up for the French, you had already left by then. Uh, we were trying to beat the communists, and we thought it was going to be the domino theory and all of that. But still, that wasn't a threat to us, and it wasn't a threat to one of our allies. So it was kind of hard to justify, morally justify getting into that war. And, and I understand people's opposition to it. Um, when I was in school at Emory in in probably in 64, 65, we even had a rally at, I guess it was the old, the old football field before Turner Field. And I think um, Anita Bryant came and sang. It was called Affirmation Vietnam. It was a rally in support of, of the war. It wasn't put on by Emory, I can tell you, but, but I don't know who organized it, but I remember that. So even in Atlanta, in, in the early stages of the war, there was some support for it. But obviously that all kind of went away, and especially after, after Kent State and things like that. Um, but it was a funny war. We used to say it's not much of a war, but it's the only one we've got. Uh, because if you're in the military, you need combat experience, and you need those kinds of things. That, yeah. That's a different way of looking at it, and, and it doesn't sound very good to say that, I guess. but. But you, you still need to get something like that in your belt, and, and, yeah. and so we we did. And before we finish, I want to give you a chance to say anything else you would like to say, or any message you would like to give, or just anything you want to add to your story. I, I don't have anything that's that's profound. I'm, I'm, I'm I was glad to get the opportunity to do this when Sue told us that that you guys were doing this. I I think I rushed up to her and said, "I want to do it. I want to do it." She didn't yeah. have to twist my arm or anything, but I'm, 
Thanks. This has been fun, and it's made me think about a lot of the things that that went on back then in kind of a different way, trying to figure out how to tell the story. And mm -hmm. and uh, as we as we get older, uh, we we think about how to how to tell our stories and how to let our kids know and, and grandchildren know. And and I appreciate the opportunity to do this. Well, we're glad you came in too, and I. You're very modest, just like most of the veterans are. I mean, you did put your life on the line 93 times well, in Vietnam. A, a, a lot of people uh, did a lot more, though. And you, um, and you volunteered to do that too. It's not like you were forced to do it. Well, and, I was uh, kind of forced to do it, Joe. If I, <laughs> if, if I hadn't done what I did, I would have had to do what you did. <laughs> well, okay, it's a good point. <laughs> so it was self-preservation, really, more than any. Any, any high moral stand. But you know, some of the things you said in here, I think, show the kind of person you are. The, the work you were doing was really sort of the leading edge technology, both after you flew and af after you got out of the military. And you, you were doing a lot of work in the military that protected people that were still in the military and still in harm's way. And then after you got out, I mean, you had a, I mean, a, a full career there, mm -hmm. uh, really, again, the leading edge of technology and communications, and so you've really had a pretty fascinating group of experiences and a fascinating life, and of course still having it. Oh, it's been fun. This is the best part so far, though, is, oh, good. is being retired and getting to do things like go to Sue's genealogy class. It's hard to beat that. It, it is. <laughs> well, we really want to thank you for coming in here and telling your story, and, and thank you for your service. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you sir. for coming. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Welcome home.